It is very obvious that the Jews had planned to protect the Ark. We know the first assault upon Jerusalem was by Shisha, king of Egypt, and happened under King Solomon's son Rehoboam. It says he first took the cities in Judea before entering Jerusalem. This gave the Levites in Jerusalem a good amount of time to hide the Ark of the Covenant before the Egyptian king arrived. There were actually several attacks upon Jerusalem. It says Shishak raided the temple and its treasures, and yet there is no mention of the Ark. Although he raided the temple, we know he didn't take the Ark, as it is still in Jerusalem over 300 years later. Thus the Ark had to have been either temporarily hidden at that time, or God supernaturally protected it. The Jewish king Ossia was for the most part a good king, but when he broke the law and burned innocence in God's temple, God responded by giving him leprosy right there as he stood in the temple. So from the Bible we can see how God has not only protected the ark, but has also protected all the temple furniture. Even the Jewish kings were no exception to this rule. If they violated the temple furniture, they were directly punished. God did allow the Levites, the specially elected of the priests, to move the ark, and we know that responsibility lay upon their shoulders. When King Yoshia ordered the ark to be placed back into the temple, we learned that the ark had been their responsibility, and that they had been given the task of protecting or hiding the ark when it wasn't in the temple. King Yoshia said unto the Levites that taught all Israel, which were holy unto the Lord, Put the holy ark in the house which Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, did build. It shall not be a burden upon your shoulders. So, although we are not told the exact place the ark was taken to, we know the priests had previously removed the ark to protect it. Before the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem, there was a two-year siege, and so the priest again had enough time to hide the ark, either in the same place as before or in a new hiding place. So the point is, they were very capable of hiding it again. God tells us in the Bible that the ark had been hidden and protected from the attacks on the temple for centuries, so they would not have been taken by surprise with nowhere to hide the ark when the Babylonians besieged Jerusalem. They had previously tried and tested methods they could put into use. Now some people think that the ark might have been destroyed or stolen by the Egyptians or the Babylonians or perhaps even taken to Babylon where they melted down its gold. Again, let's see if this is even a possibility, biblical speaking. While there is no direct answer to this, what I try to do when the Bible doesn't say something directly is look at patterns of behavior shown in the Bible as God doesn't change. In my opinion, this is secondary biblical evidence, so I'm going to raise a few questions related to this specific topic and then try and answer them. Do you remember the importance of the ark? If the ark was destroyed by the Babylonians, is it possible the Bible authors were so embarrassed that they did not mention it in their chronicles or prophetic writings? After all, covering up defeat and failure isn't unusual in historical writings. Yet there is nothing in the Bible to suggest that this is a possibility. The Bible always faithfully records even the greatest failures of the kings and the people. Their losses and all their shame is carefully recorded. It's a historical record where they don't in any way portray themselves as victorious when they are not. They were only victorious a few times, but they were humiliated by more enemies than the Babylonians. And this was also carefully recorded. While it is embarrassing for the people of Israel, it is honest. In fact, still today, people all over the world preach about their failures and unfaithfulness as an example for us not to follow. So would the Bible purposely forget to record it if the ark was ever taken? Such a dramatic event, the very symbol that God had chosen to dwell amidst this people. Even when the brass layer outside the temple was taken, it was faithfully recorded. Why then would they not mention the most important artifact? When the ark was taken by the Philistines, it was all carefully recorded, even down to all its specific movements, recording every single city it was moved to before it was returned to Israel. This shows how the Bible writers are honest and have no problem faithfully recording their own losses, even losing the ark. 
So according to this pattern, it seems fair to assume that the reason the biblical authors didn't record the destiny of the ark was either because they didn't know what happened to it, or that they were in fact hiding its destiny in order to protect its location. In my opinion, both of these suggestions are more in harmony with the biblical pattern than all the allegation that it was actually stolen, and such a momentous event was not recorded due to the pride of the author. Let's look a little more into the pos possibility that it could have been destroyed. Looking at the God of the Bible who never changes, we know he allowed the temple to be destroyed, but does that necessarily mean he would allow the ark to be destroyed? In fact, while he prophesied the city and the houses would be destroyed, he never mentioned the ark being destroyed or taken. However, he does warn of vengeance for the destruction of the temple. The voice of them that flee and escape out of the land of Babylon to declare in Zion the vengeance of the Lord our God, the vengeance of his temple. And, make bright the arrows, gather the shields. The Lord hath raised up the spirit of the kings of Medes for his device against Babylon to destroy it, because it is the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance of his temple. Again, no mention of vengeance for the ark being destroyed, the throne, just the temple. After all, the temple's primary function was to house the ark, God's throne on earth, so recording its fate would have been more important than the fate of the temple. So why would God claim... He would punish Babylon for having destroyed the temple, but have nothing to say about the ark being destroyed. As we mentioned, when the ark was taken by the Philistines, God did not allow it to be condescended by the conquerors. In fact, the pagan idol Dagon was forced to bow before the ark. Furthermore, God sent plagues over these pagan nations until they returned the ark. Anyone who was careless in regard to the ark died, including the people of Beth Shemesh who saw the ark returning from the Philistines. They were Jews, but were not spared. Later, when David was moving the ark to Jerusalem, one of the guardians touched the ark and he was instantly killed. So what is God telling us through these stories? That he is guarding the ark from being tampered with. In fact, the man who touched the ark was only trying to help, even though what he did was against God's specific requirements. God didn't need help from man to protect his ark. David feared when he saw this and was too scared to move the ark to Jerusalem, so he found a guardian to take care of it nearby. So God is showing us the following three things with these stories. 1. The ark doesn't need to be protected by man. It's perfectly safe in God's hands. 2. God guarded the ark closely, even when it was in the enemy's hands. And three, he did not let any other gods or people belittle the throne of God. Please understand that these three points are not assumptions. It's what the Bible actually tells us about how God handles his ark. So what is the logical conclusion here? When the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem, God didn't care about the ark anymore. No, he had taught both the pagan nations and his own people so carefully regarding his ark. Is it even conceivable that now it all didn't matter anymore? That he wasn't going to protect it anymore? Remember the Israelites had fallen away when the ark was captured by the Philistines. Even though they were unfaithful, it didn't mean God allowed the ark to be destroyed, nor was it used to degrade the God of Israel to, to below a pagan god. Notice again the pattern found in scripture regarding God's dealings with the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, he doesn't change. So based on these patterns, the Ark was almost certainly guarded by God. All the relevant scriptures say God guards his Ark, and not one scripture indicates otherwise. So we should really believe that, since there is no evidence, indication, or pattern to indicate otherwise. Would the Lord step down from being king over Israel and let the throne be rejected? Remember, according to prophecy, he was going to re-establish the Jewish nation in Jerusalem. Remember also the fourth commandment in the law below God's throne says his area of domin dominion is the whole earth. So what would happen if he allowed this to be destroyed? His throne, indicating he is the rightful owner of the earth. Was he still the rightful king of earth, even when the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem? What did God himself claim? Behold the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth. His message for Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, was, 
until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. That's right, he still claimed to rule above Nebuchadnezzar who had just destroyed his temple. How empty these words would have been if Nebuchadnezzar had just destroyed God's throne, a throne which laid claim to the entire earth. God was still king on the earth, king o over all kings, and he was still ruling over Nebuchadnezzar. So if God allowed the ark to be destroyed, it would not only destroy his claim as king over Israel, but also his claim to be king over the entire planet. The ark would not fall with Israel. It would still be the throne of God even when Israel failed, just as it always had been in the past. While it is true that the devil usurped leadership over the earth when the inhabitants chose to follow him, it was not total leadership nor was it permanent. If God had accepted this, he would not subsequently have intervened in the events taking place on earth, nor would he have been allowed to judge it. The fact that he will come and judge the inhabitants of the earth reveals that the context of the fourth commandment still stand, the earth is God's area of dominion. Isaiah 24 says, On the final day of judgment, all the inhabitants of the earth will be judged for having broken the law in the ark. So they were not just rules that the Jewish nation were to be judged by, but everyone. So back to the discovery of the Ark of the Covenant underneath Golgotha by the late Ron Wyatt. If Christ's blood went down upon the mercy seat on God's earthly throne, then it symbolized that the kingdom was taken back from the thief and thus with power to forgive man, God restored himself fully as king on earth. So it's logical that God would protect his earth earthly throne to show the world that the earth is still his rightfully dominion as he is creator. But more than that, he is the one who can give pardon to the transgressors of this very same law. Could these scriptures apply to his earthly throne as well as the heavenly? Is his earthly throne of less value? I would say certainly not. Psalm 45, 6, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Thy scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. For the Lord Most High is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. He shall choose our inheritance for us, the excellency of Jacob, who he loved, Selah. God is gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises unto our king, sing praises, for God is the king of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. God reigneth over the heathen. God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. The princes of the people are God gathered together, even the people of the God of Abraham, for the shields of the earth belong unto God. He is greatly exalted. King Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord, right before where the Ark of the Covenant was. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, God of Israel, which dwelleth between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. And he said, Now therefore, O Lord of God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. So this means that U.S. of A., Russia, whatever country it is, they all has, have to answer to God in that final day. When Jeremiah was lamenting over the destruction of the temple, he didn't mourn over God's throne having been destroyed, but he said, Thou, O Lord, remainest forever, thy throne from generation to generation. What did Jeremiah know? It doesn't sound like God's earthly throne had just been destroyed. It sounds like it was saved from the enemy's hands. The book of Hebrews quotes what we just read in Psalms, confirming its validity in the New Testament. But notice how Paul says it here. Unto the Son thy throne is forever and ever. But unto the Son he has said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. So the question is, could God's earthly throne so easily be destroyed while his heavenly throne was protected? Would God not protect both if they were both still valid? Wasn't the Son made king of earth? Isn't then the earthly throne also of the uttermost importance? But the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment.
Justice and judgment are the inhabitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. For the Lord is our defense, and the Holy One of Israel is our King. His seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. Now let's go back to the time of the first temple destruction. God shows clearly that he has in no way stopped reigning as king over Israel, or indeed over the entire world. He claims he was the one who gave Israel into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. He also said he was still in control over his people despite their captivity. They shall be carried to Babylon, and there shall they be until the day that I visit them, saith the Lord. Then will I bring them up and restore them to this place. When Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, suffered an inflated opinion of himself and declared, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom, by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? The Bible continues, While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, The kingdom is departed from thee. Even Nebuchadnezzar had to answer to God as the supreme ruler. Daniel the prophet had warned Nebuchadnezzar, Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thy iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. Then God strips Nebuchadnezzar of all his majesty and even his sanity for seven years. And when Nebuchadnezzar finally realizes who God is, he says, And at the end of the days I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doth according to his will in the army of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can stay his hand or say unto him, What dost thou? After Nebuchadnezzar's admission, God reinstated his position and majesty. God shows us here that he is still in control and that his kingdom has not ended. He keeps showing us who is the real ruler when he decides how long Israel is to remain captive and the land desolate. He forces the land to lie desolate for seventy years for the sake of his Sabbaths and for the sake of his law. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. And it shall come to pass, when seventy years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity, and the land of the Chaldeans, and will make it perpetual desolations. When these seventy years are over, God makes sure the new kings of Media and Persia fulfill his will to let his people go and order the rebuilding of a second temple. God is showing that from the moment his people are judged, he is still king and his area of dominion is still the earth. When Babylon was at its peak, God gave Nebuchadnezzar a dream showing him how all the kingdoms of the earth, both his and those that followed, would all amount to nothing. The statue represented the kingdom of Babylon and her successive kingdoms, and the rock which struck it meant that in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Now Nebuchadnezzar was not pleased with the idea that his kingdom would perish and another take his place. So we ordered to have a statue made, just like in his dream, except this statue would be of pure gold, in his attempt to represent his kingdom as never-ending. When he ordered everyone to bow before it, three Jewish men refused and declared that they only worshipped the God of Israel. Nebuchadnezzar decided to kill them by casting them into the fire, but God counted Nebuchadnezzar's action by miraculously protecting his faithful and not allowing them to be burnt. The Son of God himself visited those three men in the furnace and protected them from the flames. As Nebuchadnezzar was trying to exalt the image of his never-ending kingdom, God answers by showing him his son, he who would save man and re-establish him in God's kingdom, the one whose kingdom was represented by the rock destroying the statue in the dream. Of him it is written, and he had on his vesture and on his tie a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So again, was the ark taken to Babylon? 
when the Bible lists all the items taken from the temple and returned to Babylon. It even mentions small insignificant things like spoons, but there is no mention of the ark. So the Bible recorded in detail everything that was taken from the temple. And you can read this description in Jeremiah. So they knew down to the very last detail what the king of Babylon took. Now let's see just how protective God really was over his holy things that had been taken from the temple. Several of the items from the temple were now in Babylon, but notice how the Babylonians had not destroyed these items. They had respect for them enough to keep them safe. They were stored away, not destroyed or reused for common purposes. But having said that, a very ungodly king by the name of Belshazzar didn't show the respect that his father and grandfather before him did. It says Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his princes, his wi wives and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood and of stone. In the same hour came forth finger of a man's hand and wrote over against a candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote, and this is the writing that was written. Mene, mene, tekel ufar sin. This is the interpretation of the thing. Mene, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighted in the balances and art found wanting. Peres, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. And what happened? This was the final end of the Babylonian Empire. His sentence was written out on the wall next to him. Belshazzar had provoked the Most High so terribly. The writing on the wall read, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Ufarsin, meaning God would allow the whole kingdom of Babylon to fall forever. And it was this last ungodly act that determined it. It was the last straw. In the same way as God protected the ark when it was placed in the temple to Dagon by the Philistines, he now even protected the cups from the temple, so much so that he supernaturally intervened in the feast and made the whole kingdom of Babylon fall that very same evening. So my question is this, if God would intervene in such a major and dramatic way for the sake of the temple cups, is it likely he would be indifferent about the ark? Were the cups now more important than the ark, his very throne on earth, his testimony, the throne which lays claim to his right to judge the kings of the earth, including King Belshazzar, whom he just judged? All this shows us that God was still in control of every item belonging to the temple, so based on this, it's hard or even impossible to believe that God would easily allow the ark to be destroyed or even dishonored without intervening. The ark wasn't in Babylon, so it didn't need any protection or supernatural intervention. The ark was hidden away in a safe place. As Jeremiah said while he was overlooking Jerusalem and the temple in ruins, Thou, O Lord, remainest forever thy throne from generation to generation. Through this and other stories, God shows us that Babylon never conquered him and that he always had control over the situation. In fact, he prophesied they would return after 70 years and he made sure that that happened miraculously exactly at the time he said. After the Medio Persian took over the kingdom and with it gained custody over the temple items, God wrestled with the new king, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me and I remained there with the kings of Persia. God fought with the new king to let his people return to the land of Israel, and guess what? God made sure that everything taken to Babylon from his temple was returned. Also Cyrus the king brought forth the vessels of the house of the Lord which Nebuchadnezzar had brought forth out of Jerusalem and had put them in the house of his gods. Even those did Cyrus king of Persia bring forth by the hand of Mithriath the treasurer and number them unto Sh Sheshbazar the prince of Judah. And this is the number of them, thirty charges of gold, a thousand charges of silver, nine and twenty knives, thirty basins of gold, silver basins of a second sort, four hundred and ten, and other vessels, a thousand. All the vessels of gold and of silver were five thousand and four hundred. 
All this did Sheshbazar bring up with them of the captivity that were brought up from Babylon unto Jerusalem. That's so amazing and again shows a God who is in control. The pattern shows God's in control and not one item ever went unprotected by a God. Why would God make sure this information was included in scripture? Why is it so important for us to know about these small items? I personally think it is to give us a message that the ark and the other original temple furniture was hidden away and taken good care of. What about the law inside the ark? Would God allow that to be destroyed? Psalm 89:34 says, My covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Matthew 5:18 For verily I say unto you till heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now one of the reasons it's easy to think God would allow the ark to be destroyed is if the ark is viewed solely as a Jewish object. Lowering the identity of the ark and forgetting who the owner of it is connects the ark to something that could be as easily destroyed as anything else. It would be like thinking that God regarded the ark in the same way as the temple which he did allow to be destroyed. It might be tempting to think that the ark was no longer protected after the Shekinah departed from it and no longer dwelt upon it. But remember there was no Shekinah before or during the ark's captivity among the Philistines but that did not mean it wasn't under God's protection. Although he wasn't ruling from the throne at that point in history, he still protected the throne and what it represented. The god Dagon was first to bow before the ark containing the law that allowed no other gods than the true creator. And this is important, the law was still valid even when its king wasn't present through the Shekinah. Many Christians think the law is done away with after the Messiah came, while other Christians think the ceremonial laws were fulfilled by the Messiah, but that the moral law in the ark plus some other laws is still valid. Either belief indicates that God would protect the covenant and the law at least until the Messiah arrived, and I believe, of course, even afterwards. The ark is called the ark of the testimony for the following reason. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. So the law inside the ark is God's testimony. But testimony to who? The ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth. So would God allow his testimony that he is Lord of all the earth, the only God, the creator, to be destroyed? Especially at a time when he wasn't even finished with his own people. Remember, his plans were just to punish them for a while and then take them back to Jerusalem. Unlike us humans, God knows the future and he doesn't change his mind, so everything he does has a meaning. The ark was taken from the Jewish ceremonial system long before the system was to cease. Obviously, God had a plan that involved the ark, a plan that was bigger than the sacrificial system and bigger than the Jewish nation. Otherwise, he would have allowed them to keep the ark until the sacrificial system ended. So there is a mysterious destiny connected with the ark, and a little of this mystery is unfolded in Psalm 9-7. He has prepared his throne for judgment, and God reigneth over the heathen. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant, therefore hath the curse divorced the earth. God tells us in the Bible that he protects it even when the Shekinah isn't there and even when his people are subjected to surrounding kings. He is still in control, but he also tells us through the Bible that God's testimony inside the ark has a future role and in the book of Revelation we see the testimony will partake in the judgment of the whole earth. Was God's testimony anything less than perfect? Was there any reason for God not to care about protecting it? The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Through the prophet Isaiah, we are even told that those who reject the testimony are not to be trusted. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So did God allow his testimony to be destroyed? There are so many scriptures, much more than I have mentioned here, that all reveal a a consistent pattern of a God in control and protecting his ark from not only the heathen, but also protecting it from the Jews themselves.
Again, the scene of Uzzah's death gave us an important message. And when they came unto the threshing floor of Shidon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him, because he had put his hand to the ark, and there he died before God. Who was Uzzah? He was part of the household that for years had protected the ark in their house after it had been taken by the Philistines. They had been highly blessed caring for it, and yet there was still no pardon given to Uzzah when he reached out to study the ark when the oxen stumbled. The strong message God is sending through this story is that even a blessed and good Israelite is not allowed to tamper with the ark. The message is clear. God does not need man to protect the ark on his behalf. Having the ark with them was a blessing given by God to them as a nation, but it was still God's holy object. And David was afraid of God that day, saying, How shall I bring the ark of God home to me? So David brought not the ark home to himself to the city of David, but carried it aside into the house of Obed Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of God remained with the family of Obed Edom in his house three months. And the Lord blessed the house of Obed Edom and all that he had. So even the king of Israel, God's beloved King David, knew that God controlled the ark and not himself or any man. Did the ark sin? Did the ark fail God? No, the people did. And so, is it biblical to think the ark was destroyed? I can't see that it is. Only if one thinks of the Bible as simply a history book, and that there were really no God, then it would be possible. But the law was not done away with, and not destroyed, and the covenant was still standing. So the ark could not have been destroyed around the time the Babylonians invaded Judah. If God had allowed that, it would have signified that he had broken his covenant, and we know he hadn't. The following prophecy is about the time when Babylon was to conquer Jerusalem. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbath, as long as it lieth desolate, and ye be in your enemy's land, even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbath. As long as it lieth desolate, it shall rest, because it did not rest in your Sabbath, when ye dwelt upon it. If they shall confess their iniquity, and the iniquity of the fathers with their trespass, which they trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that, I, and that I also have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised heart be humbled, and they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember, and I will remember the land, and yet for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly, and to break my covenant with them, for, for I am the Lord their God. Although in the Bible we learn how the people broke the covenant with God, but never does God say he will destroy his testimony or that it is no longer binding. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips.